With that, it's my pleasure to introduce both Dr. Aldrich and Dr. Benson. They're going to be giving you all fishing spots today. So, <laughs> uh, first of all, I will not be giving any fishing spots away today. There's plenty of water out there for everybody. I was thinking about this, uh, it's kind of interesting. I have a PhD in mathematics, and when I give a mathematics lecture to a general audience, I get really nervous. Uh, but I have a very limited education in biology, and talking about fish, that doesn't really seem to faze me. <laughs> and I guess it's because I don't really, I'm not afraid of being wrong. Uh, and in fact, I kind of expect I will be wrong. So I apologize for any errors ahead of time. Rob? Good. This isn't working. You can mouse it. <laughs> no, I can't. Oh, there it is. Here, you want to try it? That's not working either. <laughs> I mean, this is PowerPoint. There you go. We're cool. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, quick, what am I going to talk, or what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we have a couple of announcements. I will discuss what I am not, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about trout uh, and a little bit of fish identification. Primarily going to be interested in what trout eat and what factors impact the availability of trout food. And then uh, Dr. Benson is going to come and talk to you about um, how to collect some of that information either before you go out, while you're out, or potentially after you come back. <clears throat> the first announcement is that Adam State has a, a relatively new club on campus. It is called the Five Rivers Fishing Club. I think uh, the intention is that it will become an ASNF sponsored club as soon as possible. It's sponsored by the local Trout Unlimited chapter. And if anybody is interested at all in either learning how to fly fish um, getting on the water with some people that do know or do not know how, they, how to fish, um, if you want to learn how to cast, if you want to learn how to tie a fly, uh, you might think about joining this club. Uh, the president of, of the club is here, you can ask him all. I don't know if you want to say anything. No. I think you covered it. Okay. Uh, when's your next meeting? Uh, it's going to be next week and that's to be determined if you want to find out. Uh, I've got a sign up sheet, write your name and email address. Uh, we've got a when to meet link uh, out, and we'll figure out the best meeting time from there. So we're not going to pass this around when you're when the talks are over. If you're interested in joining the club, or just maybe you want to learn how to cast, we're going to have casting lessons relatively soon. Um, just sign up, and he'll send you an email. Uh, I am not an ichthyologist. I'm not an entomologist. I am not a biologist in general. And I would say at best, I'm an amateur fly fishing person. <laughs> I am on the Trout Unlimited board, and I would like to uh, invite you all to the charity auction, which is next Saturday, the 27th. The doors open at 6, if you're interested in coming, $5. Anyway, <clears throat> before I get into any of the details of fly fishing or fishing or trout in general, uh, John P. Ratch is, um, is an acclaimed author, uh, writes a lot about fishing and trout. And my, one of my favorite John P. Ratch quotes is, if you fish the wrong fly, Long and hard enough, it will sooner or later become the right fly. Uh, this is a true story from my, from my past. I have a buddy in Montana. I know it's hard for you to imagine I have friends, but I have a friend in Montana. <laughs> and his brother pulled a really big practical joke on him. He sent him on his first fly fishing trip with what I call joke flies. Uh, so I went fishing with him on this trip, and it was his first time using his dad's old fly rod, and uh, I decided I would take my spinning rod just because I figured the more different kinds of things you have to catch fish with, the more chances you'll have to catch fish. So we get up, we hiked in, uh, and we were kind of remotely located, and we started fishing. I pulled out my spinning rod, and I put it together, and he pulled out his fly rod, and he put it together, and he brings his fly box over to me, and he was asking me what kind of fly that I think would be the best one to use on that particular day, given the conditions, etc. And I, I looked at the box and I, I started laughing. I couldn't believe it. There was a Broncos fly. <laughs> there was a Halloween fly. And this is a true story. I said, Steve, it's not going to matter 
which fly you pick, you're not going to catch anything. <laughs> so he says, okay, I'll just practice my casting. He ties on the Broncos fly, catches fish. <laughs> <laughs> we caught, we literally caught fish with every single fly in the box. <laughs> All day long. It didn't matter what you put on there, you caught a fish. So, don't get too technical. If you just want to get out on the water and have fun, get out on the water and have fun. Uh, my, dad likes to quote me. my dad likes to quote me sometimes, and this is one of his Steve Alders quotes. I like big fish, and I really like dumb fish, but I really, really like big dumb fish. So, what are trout? Uh, I'm going to focus our attention on the San Luis Valley because there are a lot of different kinds of trout out there. In the valley, we have a variety of trout that fit into three geniuses. I don't know, generic, okay. <clears throat> some of the trout that are in Colorado are native. Some of the trout in Colorado, or most of the trout in Colorado actually are non-native trout. Uh, they fit into the three genera, Oncorhynchus, Selmo, and uh, Salvinus. Being closely related to salmon, there are salmon species in all three of these genera. So salmon and trout are very closely related. Um, in the Oncorhynchus, which means hook nose genus, You'll find all cutthroats and rainbows in there. And in the San Luis Valley, you'll find rainbow trout. We recently introduced a new strain of rainbow trout uh, that is crossbred with the German rainbow that uh, is whirling disease resistant. So you'll find some pretty wild rainbows in the Rio Grande right now. Also, we have the Rio Grande cutthroat. And I believe that the Division of Parks and Wildlife is stocking Snake River Fine Spotted Cutthroats and West Slope Cutthroats in the valley. Uh, it's either one or both of those, I'm, I'm not sure. And then we also have Cutbows, which is a, a crossbreed between a cutthroat and a rainbow. Uh, there we go. Ah, so some fish ID. If you catch a fish that has a Nice pink stripe down the middle there. That's probably going to be a rainbow. I picked this picture because you can kind of see the hook nose there. You'll see that in a lot of salmon as well, but not all. And just as a word of warning, I picked some of my information and pictures from the internet. You really need to be careful if you're gonna use this information to identify your trout. Here's a quick Google search of Rio Grande cutthroat images. And you can see, uh, for example, in this one, you can see why it's called a cutthroat. Right down there underneath the lower jaw on all cutthroat, there should be a red stripe of some varying colors of red. But what's interesting about the internet is if you Google images of Rio Grande cutthroats, you'll also find things like this. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but I can tell you this is not even a cutthroat, although it does look like a trout. And you'll see pictures of something that I just showed you a picture of. That's a rainbow, so don't believe everything you read. Uh, Snake River, uh, this is called a fine spotted cutthroat. If you look at the spots here, and compare them to some spots you'll see later. The, the spots there are really small compared to most other cutthroats. Uh, you'll see a lot of these in some of the bigger reservoirs upriver from here. And the west slope, you see the spots there are quite a bit different than the other ones. So most trout right up top of my head have quite a few spots, but they're not all the same color. So that's one way to keep, keep an eye on. My general recommendation is that if you catch a cutthroat trout, you put it back in the water. I say it's a general recommendation because if you catch a real grand cutthroat and keep it, you're in big trouble. Those fish are endangered, and we are trying to regrow that population. If you can't tell the difference between a real grand cutthroat trout and any of the other cutthroat trout, then you just put them all back and you don't have to worry about it. Another reason I say that is because the cutthroats are the only ones that are native to Colorado. <coughs> We only have one species from the Salmo genus that's in the valley, and that's the brown. It's a non-native species, but you will find some pretty darn big ones in the Rio Grande. If you go up there and try hard enough. 
And in the Salvelinus, we have three, I guess two species and one cross, the brook trout, the lake trout, and the splake. The splake is a cross between a brook and a lake. And this is a profile that you will see on just about any small water in the valley. So if you go to a small creek and start fishing, if you have your nice um, polarized sunglasses on, you look in the water, you're going to see this a lot. And the reason why I'm showing it to you is because, you see those white stripes on the four fins? That's a general indicator that you're looking at a brook trout. And brook trout are so populous in this valley, and actually the state, that they have their own fishing regulations. You can keep a lot more small brook trout than you can keep with just about anything else. So in general, for example, you cannot keep any real grand cutthroats, but if you catch 10 small brook trout, you can fry them all up and eat them and you'll be within the fishing regulations. I think it's 10, is anybody know? It's eight. Eight? Yeah. It was 10 in the somewhat distant past, but I never keep 10 in these uh, This is one that looks probably a lot different than the other ones. You see that it has spots, but the spots are not black like most of the other spots you've seen. Okay, so talking about fishing, then you want to know what are the fish eating so that you can try to imitate that and try to catch the fish on your imitation. Like many fish, trout are opportunistic feeders. They will eat just about anything that's alive and smaller than they are, uh, including their own fry. So a, a brown trout is not going to have any problem eating smaller brown trout. They will also eat bugs, they will eat mice, they will eat um, worms, including flatworms and leeches, they will eat popcorn, cheese, Broncos flies. <laughs> <laughs> Some year-round staples in the trout diet, though, are the larval and pupal forms of flies. Uh, the larval and pupal forms of a lot of flies are aquatic. They live in the water. Some of them are multi-year life, life stages, I'm sorry, life processes. So uh, you'll have a lot of bugs in the water pretty much all the time, and the fish are going to eat whatever they can find. Uh, you're really only going to see emergers and adult flies when the conditions are right, and that's kind of what I want to talk about. As an example, there's a fly called a blue-winged olive. Blue-winged olive comes from a whole group of mayflies in the order of Ephemeroptera, and trout bums like to call them betas. It's kind of interesting. Does anybody know what you're actually supposed to say? Do any of the biologists know what this is actually called? So if I'm a fly fish, a fly a trout bum, and I'm going to call it, you know, I'll just call it betas, but betas is a huge class of flies, and it's not even pronounced betas. Anyway, <coughs> you'll see the pictures here. Uh, this is an example of a nymph. This is a mayfly nymph. The classic nymph of a mayfly is going to have those three, I don't even know what they're called, things sticking out. Then <laughs> down here, so I don't have a picture of an egg. They're really small. Uh, so here's the nymph, and then this is called a dun. The dun is a mayfly that has emerged from the water to mate. Uh, after they mate, the females go back to the water to lay their eggs, and that's typically when you get the spinner stage. And you can fish any of these with imitation. So if you want to catch a fish and you really don't know what you're doing, one idea is to just tie on a nymph BWO imitation and see if you can catch them. Because those BWO nymphs are in the water almost all year round, and the fish will eat them on a regular basis. What I'm suggesting to you is that these other two stages are only going to occur in very specific weather and other kinds of conditions. And so what we're going to be talking about today is, how do I know what those are, and what can I do to get those kinds of pieces of information? So this is just an example. I'm not saying that this is exactly perfectly correct, but this is just an idea of what you might see. Um, the nymphs are in the water all year round. They're going to swim to the surface, and they're going to change from the nymph to the adult on the surface of the water. This is a very vulnerable time for them because they're just floating on the river or stream or lake, wherever they are, until they actually can fly, and then they fly away from the water. They go and mate, and then they come back to <coughs> the eggs. Good conditions for a BWO, BWO or a <coughs> olive hatch would be something like 40 to 60 degree water, cool air temperatures, I'm not going to define what cool means, uh, 
you really want overcast skies, and a lot of people are hesitant to fish when it's overcast. A lot of us experienced fishermen and women, when we see overcast skies, we think, man, I really <coughs> wish I was on the water today. Because that's a really good uh, time to see uh, mayfly hatches. And then the time of day is also going to matter, because the blooming olives typically are not going to hatch in the morning. If you're out there fishing with a blooming olive imitation at 8 o'clock in the morning, you're probably not going to catch anything. I say probably because all of these rules get broken. You could probably go catch a fish with a Broncos fly at 7 a.m. Who knows? <laughs> so I, I got this information from a variety of places, including my own personal experience. But I thought I would show you what you can find real quickly on the, inter in, on the Internet uh, in relation to these blooming olives. This is a fishing update from Ark Anglers up in Salida. And I'll just read a little bit of it to you. It says... Blueing olive mayflies remain the primary hatch, occurring between 1 and 4, particularly when there is some cloud cover. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> I mean, this is 4.12, so that's just, what, four days ago? Five days ago, thank you. Cool, cool cloudy weather is forecast for the week of 4.15, ideal conditions for a hatch. And then they'll tell you a little bit more about it. So if you know what to look for, you might think about tying on some blueing olives. Uh oh, now what have I done? There we go. You fixed it. I did. I don't know how I did it, but I did. So let's pretend that you're actually on the water. You want to, you have a box full of every kind of blooming olive imitation there is. You have the, you have the, the larvae, you have the duns, you have the emergers, and you want to know, okay, what size and what am I going to do to actually catch a fish? A couple things you want to know. You want to know what's the sky look like? Are there clouds up there? Because if there are no clouds, you're probably not going to have a hatch. You want to look at the time. You want to say, okay, is it early morning? Is it late evening? Those are times that are probably not good for hatching. I mean, mid-afternoon is a typical blooming olive time. And if you want to know what's going on in the water, literally just reach in there, pick up a rock, and look underneath it, because you will be amazed how many bugs live on one rock. Uh, sometimes you can pick up a rock and see 100. Sometimes you pick up a rock and all you see is a rock. <laughs> But if you look at the rock, you can sometimes see the nymphs that are on there. And if you see a blooming olive nymph or two, then you know that they're in the water, in that particular water. And the, the nymphs themselves do swim from rock to rock sometimes. So uh, when they do, they're vulnerable to predation, obviously. And that might, if you just see a nymph on a rock, okay, I'm going to try it. If you don't see a nymph on a rock, you might try another rock. Uh, but if you don't ever see one, then you're probably not going to catch anything with those. You might also want to check your thermometer. One thing you can do with your thermometer is just look at it and say, what's the temperature? Because if it's really hot outside, you're probably not going to catch, see any blue olives. But also you can put your thermometer, if it's waterproof in the water, and say, is the water cold enough? Right? You want it to be around 40 to 60 degrees. If it's too cold, they're not going to hatch. If it's too hot, they're not going to hatch. Again, these rules are making it broken. Just to give you an idea of how different conditions are going to give you different flies, if you look at what's called a yellow sally, this is an example of a stone fly. There are lots of stoneflies in the Rio Grande uh, Basin. You'll see different species of uh, stoneflies in all different kinds of water. These are definitely good flies to have in your box. They have a three-stage life cycle. <coughs> the, the adults just have one stage called the adult, and then we have the eggs and nymphs. Notice that these flies look a lot different than the ones we saw before. And this mayfly has these upright wings, and then it has these things coming out of the abdomen there. And this adult has really big wings, but they're not upright. I don't see anything coming out of the abdomen. Different color, as an example. These flies have a fundamentally different life than the mayflies. These nymphs are typically in the water for two or three years. They are carnivorous. They will eat other nymphs, and they get big. I mean, you think about uh, a bug eating bugs, they're going to have a lot of protein, and the fish are going to want to eat them. Right? They're not just in there looking for food. If they see these, they're going to try to grab them quick because there's a lot of protein in there, and fish are going for the bang for the buck. We can fish, again, the nymphs and the adults. If you don't know what you're doing and you just want to try something, get yourself a stonefly nymph imitation, tie it on the end of your line, put it in the water, and see what happens. You can do the same thing that we were doing before. You can pick up a rock and see if you see them on the rocks. Um, <clears throat> these nymphs do not. Some nymphs are hard to identify, but these nymphs are pretty, pretty clear. But 
the stoneflies are looking for different conditions than the mayflies, and that's why I wanted you to look at the different species. So here we have a stonefly that is looking for water temperatures, say, in the 50 to 70 degree range. So they're looking for warmer water. And they don't want overclass, oh, sorry, over, overcast skies. They don't want this cold weather. They want it to be sunny and warm. So on a day that you look up in the sky and you say, oh man, this is a really good blooming olive day, you're probably not going to catch anything on stoneflies except for the nymphs. I mean, you might catch some on the nymphs, but not really on the adults. Uh, the exact opposite is true for the blue eggs. If you're looking in the sky, you say, wow, this is a really great day for stoneflies. It's probably a really bad day for the blue eggs. <clears throat> so now we pretend you're on the water again, but now this time your, your box is full of stonefly imitations and you want to know, what do I do? Or this time you're going to check the sky again, but now you're not looking for clouds. You want it to be clear. You want to check your watch because they do hatch at different times of day. And the larvae don't behave the same way as the mayflies. So the mayflies, they swim, and then they swim to the surface to uh, transform into adults. The stoneflies actually crawl to the edge of the water, they crawl out of the water, and then they transform on dry land. So you're not going to get these vulnerable adults floating on the top of the water. The adults that are floating on the top of the water are the females that have come back to the water after mating to lay their eggs. So if you see a bunch of mayflies on the banks, that means that relatively soon they may be coming back to get in the water and to lay their eggs. So when they come back, that's when you want to be trying on the adult limitations. One way to check that is instead of looking um, on the surface of the water for the adults, what you can do is literally just look underneath some tree leaves or underneath some leaves on the uh, willows on the, on the bank. Because the stoneflies will just kind of hang out there during the day. They'll mate and then they come back typically in the afternoon or something. Again, you're going to check your thermometer here because if it's really cold, you're not going to see any stoneflies coming back to the water. And this really happens on a regular basis. If, it's, if you get a cold front, and it, it, it's really cold for a couple of weeks, these bugs will wait for the appropriate weather. Even if it's the time of year that they would normally hatch, most of the nymphs are going to wait for the appropriate weather to actually crawl out of the water. All of that put together then, we're looking for weather, water temperature. I haven't said much about altitude, but altitude does play a big, important role factor in this because the altitude in a way determines the air temperature. If I see a really nice blooming olive hatch <coughs> at 8,000 feet and I want to come back to that water three weeks later and fish, the temperature at 8,000 feet has changed in those three weeks. It's either gone up because it's getting summertime or it's gone down because it's fall and I'm going to have a different hatch, probably. I'm not saying that's a rule, but that's a problem, a problem of occurrence. So, if I'm at 8,000 feet and I get a really nice blooming olive hatch, maybe a couple weeks later I want to go to 8,500 feet. Go up river. And then in the fall it goes the exact same <coughs> way. So I'll have a blooming olive, olive hatch in the spring and I'll fish that and then in the summertime maybe I'll fish stoneflies. You come back to the fall and the temperature is right again for the, for the mayflies and that's when you'll do the mayflies. Does that make sense? Uh, if you have any questions just hold off until the end. Dr. Benson has some things he would like to discuss. OK, so let's review real quickly what we've learned about finding things. Is altitude important? Yes. Water temperature important? Yes. And you always know exactly how to get to the place of the right altitude with the right water temperature all the time. Is that correct? No. So you want to learn about a few tools? Yes, please. OK, yes, please, right? So we can all become magic fishermen. Well, first of all, let me talk about a few things here. Uh, I'm going to give you some tools. I am not going to be telling you how to do GIS per se. Because what is GIS? OK, so some of you guys have the canned GIS thing, because you all know the right answers to the questions. But really, what is it? Can you pin it down? Can you see what it is? Uh, yeah, that's all right. Uh, you probably have a lot more experience with it than you may think. Because <clears throat> here's what a lot of people consider it to be open my range. So I get for wandering about you. There are some important differences. Because many of you know what GPS is, right? This little magic box that keeps you from getting lost. Is that correct? Is that the thing that makes you know how long it's going to take to get to your mother-in-law's house? 
so you can avoid getting there on time, <laughs> right? Well, GIS is not GPS. GIS is more of an intelligent maps kind of an approach, how you stack information together, how you manipulate things. GPS just pretty much says where you are. So GIS, logically enough, uses GPS. Okay, I mean, this is about spatial locations. Yeah, this gives you the spatial location information. It's important to appreciate that if you have one of these silly little things called an iPhone or one of the similar ones, a droid or whatever, chances are good that it has GPS in here. Even a lot of iPads have GPS built in. So, you might consider this. You can put GIS in here and use it in conjunction with the GPS that is actually in your phone. And you'll see some of the stuff coming up here in a minute. So, the idea here today is to figure out how to use some new fly fishing tools. Okay, how to expand on what you already know. And Dr. Aldrich has already given you a pretty good idea, maybe some new ideas. And this is also very key. Free is, well, is good, isn't it? <laughs> because I don't want to tell you how much private licenses cost for GIS. Free is good. So at the bottom of the screen, you will see a couple of things that will continue to appear from time to time that are very important to us. So a few things that I want you to look for as we go into this land of data, this thing called the geotiff. The geotiff is not the attitude you cop when you don't end up where you want to be. <laughs> a geotiff is simply a map or a photograph, typically an aerial photograph or satellite photograph that has some sort of reference attached to it. Because typically with GIS stuff, you work in real dimensions. Okay, you might be looking at a little map on your screen, but it is in real dimensions. If the map is showing an area that's 100 miles square, <coughs> fair enough. That's how the computer's going to view it. It just adjusts your viewpoint. It's very nice. So geotips are good things to think about. There are files that have images. You've already seen some IMG files today. You've also seen these guys, good old JPEGs. These are picture files as well. But here's the one that we're really going to hit on today. KMZ and KML. What does that stand for? Don't worry, I don't know either. But it goes with Google Earth. And then lastly, there's a more complicated crowd that you can keep an eye out for if you want to actually get into using uh, GIS in more detail uh, on your spare time and you don't feel like going fishing. Uh, you can look for these things, they're called shape files. And these are the Esri native uh, format files for playing with maps. Okay. So, it's very important to appreciate that these tools, I mean, if you want to play with them all day long, that's fine. The problem is if you play with them all day long, what does that do to your fishing time? What would you rather do? Sit on a screen or sit on the water? Or stand in it? <laughs> I prefer to be in the water catching things. Um, so here's an example of a website. Whoops, let me go back here. Uh, it will start giving us an idea of what some information is. Now, you guys are all happily writing down this URL, right? Yep. I know you're not. You get to see them all at the end. So we'll have this information available for you later. Uh, this is a um, Division of Water Resources site, and this has some really cool stuff on it. This is a great, it says retrieving map. It's like, where did it come from? Okay, you all know where this is, right? There's a lot of stuff on here. And what's really scary, and this is an, uh, an internet map server, a GIS map server, and notice there's a whole lot of stuff here. These are all different kinds of layers representing different information. And each one that's checked already, that means it's activated. It means we can see it. Uh, okay, great. Are you seeing everything on this map you want to see if you're interested in fishing? No. What do you see that's good? Rivers. Yeah, we have these lake things, we have these blue water sorts of things. Uh, there's an elevation implied here with the shaded relief map. But that's not, that's not very quantitative, is it? Because what has Dr. Aldrich talked about? Temperature and altitude, how it relates to bugs, which of course is what fish like to eat. So let's go up to one of our water ones here. Of course, it's going to retrieve and retrieve and retrieve, but something magical is happening. Look at that. That one's even more confusing. <coughs> However, 
what each one of those dots represents is a stream gauging station. That's good information, and you'll see why coming up. Uh, so you could go to this, and you can download these files, and you might consider this as being part of your reconnaissance survey, where you're getting ready to go out and fish, and you're going to go out and plan. So that's great. We can you know, get some information. We can figure out what's there and stuff. But now let's go to something else, another free one. Does this look at all familiar? Have you seen something like this just a minute ago? This is another internet map server. And you may have seen some numbers floating around in the previous one that refer to the actual drainages. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You're not impressed, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Colorado. Great. Does that help us fish? Well, make sure we have the right license. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll just point at these guys over here. These all make a lot of sense, don't they? These are the actual descriptive locations of where all these things are. And unfortunately, anticipating sluggish data, I went ahead and pulled up a direct link. This is one that's out in the Rio Grande. And this has other information. Okay, this is actually coming off of the specific site. This is on the Twin Mountains Bridge. Uh, this is a common pullout. Uh, and this is live information. I mean, this is great, isn't it? Well, <coughs> see this red line? That's river flow. This is historic flow. Okay, that can be a little depressing, I know, thinking about river flows, but that sort of implies that runoff hasn't started yet, right? Uh, well, okay, great. So now we have an idea about the river flows are like. Now, truck really don't care about river flows, just as long as they have a nice place to eddy in behind a rock and, and there is water. But let's go over to the thing that affects other stuff. I just clicked on the water temperature radio button. Okay, now water temperature is one of those things we're interested in, right? Now look at this. Got ups and downs all day long, right? That's great. Let's look at something that's a little more relevant to perhaps a three-day weekend. I just zoomed in on it a little bit. Okay, now, what's the problem? What are some of the temperature ranges that Dr. Aldrich threw out there? 40 to 60. 40 to 60, 50 to 70. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. I know, what bumps, right? This is in Celsius. <coughs> 10 degrees Celsius is roughly 50 degrees. Okay, does that give you kind of a feel for things? Okay, so if you are observing water temperatures, are we going to see a lot of fly activity today out there? Things coming up off the bottom? Okay, so instead of going fishing today, what are you going to do? Stay home and play with GIS. <laughs> right? Well, I know better, so I, I don't think that's going to happen. But you know, think about this. I mean, this is good information. Uh, you can track this over a few days. You can even go back to the 10-hour, uh, the 10-day one and start looking at trends. Okay, so we're starting to accumulate some tools here. So you may be familiar with some of the stuff we're going to look at next. Uh, this is another map server that the USGS runs. Uh, this one's really cool. Uh, of course, you're supposed to read this, and you'll probably recognize what we're talking about here in a minute. Uh, you're all familiar with this part of the world. Uh, again, we're dealing with data glut here. There's an awful lot of stuff, but what do you think all these things are over on this side? Oh, these, these are all different data layers. Uh, I just assume delete anything having to do with structures and government, but that's okay. Um, we can go in here and zoom in a little bit. <coughs> Things looking familiar here? I'm going to go ahead and pan. It's easier to pan with this thing. Okay, are we seeing like familiar places we might have fished? We see where the Rio Grande is, Del Norte and so forth. How many of you guys have been up to Sawatch Park? If you haven't, go soon, when I'm not up there. <laughs> okay, now if you look carefully at this map, you may see that uh, there's a place over here called Stone Cellar Campground. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Deacon, don't write that down. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, and this is the main stem of Salach Creek, and the west and north, uh, yeah, the west and the north forks are coming in. There's East Salach Creek there. Johns Creek comes in. Uh, this is a wonderful place to fish. Now, that looks kind of, I mean, do we really get a good feel for what that area is like? It's got blue squigglies from creeks, and yeah, there's some topography there. If we go over to this other thing called overlays, we'll come back to this thing, and then look at this one right here called imagery. That's a little nicer, isn't it? And what we can do with this guy is that, you know, if we find a particular area that we think is really good and we want to somehow get it into a place where we can use it maybe in the field, uh, we can go over here to download data. And my recommendation, because I'm lazy, is just to not even bother with anything other than click here to download what you see. All right? No muss, no fuss, no bother. Uh, and then you have to choose some things. There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, what do you think we're going to be most interested in? We could put the hydrography on there, but <coughs> this is the one I really like. I'm, I'm definitely part of the uh, keep it simple crowd. And so we can process things. Okay, all you data riser observers, do you see any data rising stuff up here to pay attention to? UTMs. Well, UTM's part of it. Did I mention UTM's today? GeoTIFF, right there. So what that's going to do is download a map which has coordinates on it, built in, ready to go, uh, in a GIS system. Okay, so it's adding stuff to my cart. Guess what? It's free. Uh, and we can actually check out at this point. They make it very comfortable, like you're getting some money for your dollar. Or whatever. Okay, now at this point, you could actually uh, you know, type in your email address and then you get you know, a bunch of stuff coming. And then rather than mess with all that, I'll show you what the file actually looks like. Comes out looking like this. This is what your email will have in it. Now, why is this cool? You can download what? Okay, but anyway, we're, we're, we're busy. We want to go fishing. We're not going to mess around with this. We're going to save that for a rainy day where the BWOs are not out. Uh, look at this one right here. Is that another data riser right there? That's a KML file. KMLs are really cool. There's one there, and there's one. Keep an eye out for those things. So at this point, we might have a really good handle on where we want to go. We have an idea on temperatures and so forth. But I don't know about you guys. You know, when you find a good fishing place, you want to go back there, right? How many of you guys have been in the same spot fishing and you've always had differing levels of luck? Yeah, I know you all have, whether you admit it or not. Uh, some of you have said, yeah, it was this big. Last time it was only that big, but I caught an even bigger one after that. Uh, but, you know, collecting data is very, very important. And what's really cool is we can collect data and tie it back into a GPS so you can actually use it. So, let's look at this thing we just downloaded. Okay, I'm asking you to suspend your disbelief. But, <clears throat> You know, we just download this KML file. A lot of times when you click on it, this wonderful thing happens because of file associations. All right, now, great. I think we need more detail. I was kissing. Right? This is the Martian view of going fly fishing. <laughs> now, does this look at all familiar? There is Stone Cellar up over in here. You know what's over in here? These are the creeks that we were just looking at. Isn't that cool? Now, for those of you who are familiar with Google Earth, you know that you can zoom in on these things and spin all around and get different kinds of views and so forth. And I'm not going to steal your joy of discovery uh, with that by showing it to you too much, because I'll show you another one. This is relating to your last fishing place. <laughs> This is good info, isn't it? <laughs> now, the other thing that's really cool about uh, Google Earth, you see this little clever thing up here called a push pin? Wow. Okay, this is great. You know what you can do? You can click in here. You can type in all sorts of stuff. Like, don't let Oliver know about this. Um, <laughs> and you can go over here, and you can actually move this a little bit. See? Place mark? 
I will, I will go up here and say, yeah, Steve, I caught a great fish up there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that how that works? Haven't we done that? Uh, <laughs> now, think about this, though, from the practical point of view. You're starting to collect information that you, are, you have developed using your own smarts, fly fishing skills. You can type in information. You've got geographic location. You've got ideas on how to get there. Can you see roads and trails and so forth here? You sure can. This is really good stuff. I know you may not believe me, but... Uh, so let's look at something else. All right, now I mentioned iPhones earlier, <coughs> or similar sorts of trendy devices. Um, and many of us are snobs when it comes to technology. It's like, oh, I don't need technology. I want a bamboo fly rod. You know one of those $5,000 Orvis bat and kills? You know what I'm talking about, any of you? Yeah. We kind of have to leave in a case all the time. But this, this silly technology is really handy because what else what can you do with iPhones? In addition to GIS and Google Earth things, you can take pictures and you know, text them to people and piss them off and so forth. <laughs> but look at this one. Now this is a little grainy. This is a very tricky picture to even get to be this good. But on the left hand side, you can see my iPhone with Google Earth on it. Uh, with using a file that was downloaded using the techniques that I just showed you earlier. And in the background is my actual computer screen at home with the same drainage. So now, think about the possibilities that have just been unleashed for you. You can walk around with your iPhone with the data that you took the time to figure out, and you can actually record stuff in the field. Is that cool? You can take pictures. You can compile evidence. You won't have to lie anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So, I mean, this is, this is good stuff. This is all about collecting data and improving your fishing experience. Now, maybe you didn't think that when you first came in here and sat down and you were wondering, gosh, where are those guys going to show us this time? Uh, so, if you want to go further and get even cockier with your newfound data collection, you can go to this site and approach this with caution. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Adobe Acrobat? You all know that you can get Acrobat Reader, right? You can read PDFs all day long and so forth. It's really cool. Uh, this is the equivalent of an ArcGIS Adobe Acrobat Reader. Uh, you can download shape files and you can read them. You can pull down all those files. You can manipulate them a little bit. You really just can't save them. You can't do too much. <coughs> so this is a good thing. This is ArcGIS Explorer. So if you want to play around with stuff more, yeah, cool. You can do that. Hey, I don't want to show anything off here. Anyway, there's lots of stuff here. OK. Whoops, went too far. Uh, so in general, we've already talked about trout what they eat and so forth, what conditions produce good sorts of bugs and the like to feed them uh, and catch them, hopefully. We've got some info now, some places to find some data about optimizing conditions. I assume that you can all figure out what weather is by looking at it. And I've also, hopefully, we've given you some simple tools that you can use to expand a little technology into your fly fishing experience to become a little bit better at it. Because sometimes keeping notes gets in the way. All right, so thank you very much for this. I'm going to show one more slide in a minute that'll have all the uh, links on it and so forth. Uh, you know, Steve and I really appreciate you taking the time to come and you know sit through this and listen to us. So, what kinds of questions do you have for us? Can you email me the presentation? <laughs> Share it with somebody else. I don't know what to work to yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, half of a gluten-free, cheese-free pizza. <laughs> There are no fish in Colorado. <laughs> 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 no deer in Colorado, no elk in Colorado either. Nor grizzlies. So what are the five rivers? Actually, that's just kind of a general nomenclature. Uh, this is just one 
uh, chapter of the club as a whole. Um, there are, I believe, seven chapters in Colorado associated with, uh, you know, um, see, Fort Loser has one, uh, CU, a <laughs> uh, <laughs> couple others on the front range, Colorado College, um, Colorado Mountain College. Arkansas North Platte, South Platte, Rio Grande, Colorado. It's <laughs> <laughs> much more concise. <laughs> Easy to get to. The only time that I've been, I thought that I've been up here some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, how I went, we had travel on ATVs for. I'm certain you still can get there on ATVs. Over an hour. I think, I think you need a helicopter to get out. I'm not sure they want those. They're at your one. Is this what TV means for that? How hard it is to get this out? Is there? They put some fish in the Alamosa River and told everybody, don't fish them because we want to see if they live, and then they went back and they were gone. That was five years ago? Yeah. There are fish in the Alamosa River. They are not trout in the Alamosa River to speak of. Trout, actually, one of the big problems with pollution is the bugs. A lot of the bugs yeah. can't, can't handle it, and if there are no bugs, there are no bugs. I've heard there are some terrorists. I, yeah, I have the same level of information that you have heard, but I don't know. Can you make your electronic device and data collector for these websites? You can use the native stuff that is already in Google Earth with putting in a push pin. It's got a screen that will open up. It's fairly simplistic. If you want to get really fancy and start programming things, it is possible to do that. But for me, I'm not a fancy programmer. Uh, I found a little push pin, catalog, data window is fine, and then we'll save it for other people. You can share it with your friends. You can share it with all your friends. Except for Debbie, you can't let her know. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming, Grant. Thank you.